to me that all these issues have been brought to the attention of the church, like you said, um, illegals breaking the laws and so forth. Um, but what about, I mean, Russell Pierce, he had, you know, he was, um, I'm not sure if he was prosecuted for domestic violence. I mean, that's, that's, I don't know, that's a, that's a misdemeanor right there. Or, I mean, I, I mean, he's, he's, they have individuals that break the laws too. And it seems to me that no one has brought, you know, his behaviors to the church to um, examine his behaviors and to see, you know, I mean, because he's clearly violating the doctrines and all the church's laws and all this stuff. Has, has the church even assessed his behaviors? And I mean, he was, he, he did, he was in the newspapers in terms of hitting his wife. I mean, that's a, that, that's. You know, uh, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And I consider it to be n none of my business. I am here worrying about my own salvation. Uh, and my wife worries about it a lot too. I've been married to my wife for 40 years and she still hasn't got me to the point where she like thinks I've reached my full potential. Uh, I don't believe the Mormon church is populated by perfect people. Uh, I mean, I'm a member of the church. I'm far from perfect. And I commit mistakes and I need to repent of things. And the church uh, is here to help people in their progression towards eternity and exaltation and perfection. Uh, the Savior felt the same way. You know, the, the woman caught in adultery that uh, the Pharisees wanted the Savior to stone, what did he do? He said, he said, he of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then he knelt down and he drew in the sand. And then he stood up and he asked the lady, where are your accusers? And they'd all slunk away, because they weren't without sin. And then he says, well, neither do I condemn, condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. So I don't condemn Russell Pierce for domestic issues. I don't know about those. Uh, I don't condemn him for anything in particular. I'm just saying that I think one of the things that we ought to do as Christians is we ought to uh, be considerate of our brothers and sisters, and that we ought to work with people uh, who need to be worked with. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in the church when they find out that I'm a proponent of having uh, f free transit of the border based upon uh, just a simple check, uh, and that I don't believe we have to spend billions and billions and billions of dollars building the fence. Uh, they are shocked by that. But if I talk to them for a little while, they'll understand that I have a rationale for my beliefs. And so, do I want to cast stones at Russell Pierce? No, I'm one of those guys standing around in a circle when the Savior says, let he who has the first, has without sin cast the first stone. But why do you think the church has been silent in terms of Russell Pierce's Russell, 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 Russell Pierce behaviors? I, clearly, his behaviors have damaged um, the church. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm Latina. I'm, I have friends that are, you know, uh, uh, left the church because of um, Russell Pierce and Andrew Thomas, their anti-immigration, um, you know, rhetorics and all their, uh, so wh why do you think the church is kind of silent about these individuals and kind of just, just allow them to run mock? Clearly in Utah, they did, you know, you mentioned how they got lobbyists involved to the legislatures, but here it seems like in Arizona they've been kind of quiet, and, and which is bad. I think it's bad because, um, again, a lot of people are leaving the church. A lot of Latinos in general are leaving the church because of this, you know, animosity and this aggression towards immigrants coming from um, Russell Pierce and Andrew Thomas. And it's sad, you know, there's a lot of good people. I, my best friend at work is, is LBS. I, I love him and you know, uh, there's a lot of good people, but, but yet the church is not doing anything about, you know, about uh, 
Russell Pierce, Brian Mock, and Andrew Thomas. Well, let, let me just respond to it by saying uh -huh. this. The church does a great deal. When you see the church on its official website making official policy statements, like we've looked at this afternoon, you cannot say the church has not taken a position and drawn a line in the sand. What you can say is, is that there are individual members of the church who are not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And does everyone have the right to not pay attention? Of course they do. And every member of the church, I think, needs to work hard at figuring out what the doctrine is and then applying it in their lives. Yes, sir. If I can add to that, uh, Daryl, is that at the same time, though, you could say that in terms of Arizona, but I will tell you is that since I've been an immigration lawyer for 20 years, I rarely, and specifically in the last year or two years, the Diocese of Phoenix has not come out and spoken out, and we're predominantly Latino, and two, two, two of the three of my daughters go to Catholic school. Uh, Protestant church that I attend, same thing, will not come out and speak out about that, and the same pastors of the church and same members of the church that I can sit next to will have the polar opposite view that I have. And these are men of God and women of God, and I will tell you sincere strain in my relationship with those people because they have lost the focus. They have bought into this hypocrisy uh, permeated by the governor, permeated by Mr. Pierce, and permeated by Andrew Thomas, the sheriff, et cetera, et cetera. And it's permeated both political parties, just not the Republican Party. The Democratic Party and independents have voted for these people, and they are in political power. So I'm uh, ashamed of the Protestant churches for not assembly of God, not speaking against this. I'm ashamed the Catholic Church has not called out and spoken against this. And so it's not only the Mormon Church. I think the Mormon Church has done something here, and I and will credit you, Mr. Williams. That is, and I, and I, I didn't mean to just single out. Oh, you're not, you're not, but because you're right. Because Pierce yeah, is right. the guy that yeah. is the voice and the you're picture right. and the relationship yeah. to that church. And for that matter, Sheriff Arpaio, he attends Catholic Church. Right, right, and, and, the, and yet the Pope, and I told Dee this, I don't see the Pope coming forward. You guys need to stop this. This is abuse. You're, you're playing with children, with babies. This is dehumanizing. I have not seen the, the current Pope come forward. Um, I do remember the previous pope, he went to Mexico City and he was talking about, you know, um, issues with immigrants and um, in, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, helping them. And, and he was very vocal, the previous pope. Correct. Pope. The, 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 this issue has been come from a moral issue to a highly politicized issue. And when it comes to organizations such as the Catholic Church and the LDS Church, you have to be very, very with their organizational legal status of where they sit and as far as in states and in nation. Mm -hmm. They might jeopardize their um, 501c3 status by being involved in political issues. And yeah. by coming out politically and saying something, they will, in effect, uh, no one will their uh, And there's no excuse yeah. for that. There's no excuse There's for a policy statement just what the LDS church articulated that the church certainly can do that. Absolutely. They can Well, the LDS Church policy statement, if you read it, is very carefully framed to be a general statement and to not get enmeshed in specific legal, excuse me, political activities. Right. If the church came down here and campaigned against Russell Pierce, different. it would be different, and their 501c3 would be in jeopardy. I'm just a member of the church. I am not the church. And so when the opponent of Russell Pierce needs some money, I held a fundraiser at my office. Well, I'm engaged in political activities when I do that. I gave him the maximum I could because I find Mr. Pierce anathema to my moral construct and my paradigm for life. And I think there's a lot of Mormons who feel that way. Uh, I'm hoping that the Mormons in Legislative District 18 next week take it to the ballot box and throw him out. That's what I'm in favor of because I don't like his moral construct. Yes, sir. Uh, changing the, uh, looking at uh, your presentation, listening to that and the same comment that was excellent, uh, both from a legal and moral uh, position. But I, I believe that part of the presentation and also for the Arizona Emer uh, Employer for Immigration Reform has to come the, from the perspective that, and it seems to me that it's all Latino based and Mexico based. And I would tell you is that 
that is half of the story. The other half of the story is, and I think what Americans and business and, and people can, can hook on to is the individuals that come here from other countries lawfully with a visa and overstay here. And they go to school, they get careers, and the way they convert their status is they get married. And so that's part of the plan, and those people have parlayed into that. And those are the individuals and the immigrants that you hear on television, I did it the legal way, and I got in the line. Not true. And that's the hypocrisy of the system. And number two, those people that have done that are living amongst us. The difference being is the color of the skin. And where I live in Scottsdale, I can tell you in the test that I have those people as my clients. But you can't tell the difference between them because they speak English, they dress like you and I do, and no matter how you want to put it, they have a nice house, and they have money. And I invited, and I've invited the sheriff to come to Scottsdale, plant yourself in Shea, in Scottsdale Road, and you're going to make people upset because you're going to get a lot of those people in the community. And that's the hypocrisy of this. So I think if your presentation and the reform people present it that way, you're going to have more of an understanding because it's just not Mexico. Mexico is the conduit for people from Eastern Europe to come to the United States. They fly in there with a visa and they come up. South Americans, Central Americans have to come through Mexico. So it's just not, I think if you would expand that base, it would be more credible. Your argument is very credible, but that's the reality. It's just not Mexican. And so we would have a stronger argument saying this is a worldwide problem. Mexico is used as the entry point for Eastern Europeans, Chinese that come here all the time, Cubans that come here all the time, and it would be more, I think, uh, for the person here in the state to accept that. Well, and, and you're right, because, for example, we educate lots of engineers and scientists, and then their visa runs out, we send them home. And there's a move afoot to give those people visas. Right. Well, I don't know why they're any better than the laborer we need in the field, because it might be nice to have the research scientist but you still need somebody picking tomatoes. And so our free market takes care of that. I know a lawyer who is a very good friend of mine, uh, and she is not engaged to uh, a man from the British Virgin Islands who's an, an English citizen, because if she were engaged to him, he couldn't visit her in the United States. And so, I think they have a wedding planned, but they're not engaged. And if you're gonna go through customs and you're going to be with this guy, you're gonna have him go through a different booth than you're gonna go through and you're not gonna wear an engagement ring because they're gonna ask you if you're engaged to that guy there and if you are, he can't come in. But if he's just a British citizen, and he's got a tourist visa, and he's just visiting Phoenix, and happens to meet up with her here. I Is that legal? <laughs> I, I, I'm just aghast that that's how our laws are. And yet these people, and I know them both, they're wonderful people, and he's British. You can tell because he's got a British accent. <laughs> but he's a fine man. And he's well-to-do. He just can't be here legally if he engaged to this other lawyer that I know. <laughs> and so they're very careful not to be engaged. <laughs> it's, it's the stupidity of our laws. Yes. That's why they're bad. Yes, sir. Well, this, might, this might be a really simplistic question, but obviously the outcome is not. What is the legal process for coming to this country? <laughs> uh, Does anyone even know? There's oh, many. <laughs> but, <laughs> there's, there's, and, there's many. Right. There, there, there are many, but it is, it is, uh, it makes the Internal Revenue Code looks like a children's reading book. Uh, it is so complex and convoluted because there have been layer after layer of changes and amendment over the years, and so uh, I was in Mexico City a year ago, and I went by the uh, uh, U.S. Embassy there, and people were lined up outside to get a visa, and I thought. Well, it ain't happening. <laughs> you know, they can line up all they want. It's not going to happen. Uh, uh, and so 
And it's just unfortunate because we need those people. They are the seasoning that adds flavor to the American melt, the stew of the American melting pot. Mm -hmm. And we need those people. Uh, I certainly don't want the third generation uh, guy who's on the dole <laughs> here. I'd, you know, I'd rather deport them and have some real Americans here who are first generation enthusiastic to live the American dream. That's what I'd like to do. On your presentation, I drew the part you said, what part of the legal don't you understand? And you know, when I, presentations that I've made to groups, uh, I have a take from that, and I did make specific examples of, ironically, that you can come to the United States, with the question that you're asking, illegally, yes you can, and still immigrate. Cubans do it every day. The Chinese come to our country every day illegally through Mexico. They claim asylum for the one-child uh, policy that uh, the women claim forced sterilization. They claim home church, and they win immigration status like that because it's a function of American foreign policy also. We have people here from Central America, the Guatemalans, uh, not Guatemalans, uh, Hondurans, and from El Salvador that inherit the grace of the regime and going back to humanity to come here illegally, and they have what's called TPS because of humanitarian concerns and hurricane and earthquake in their country. We have people that come here to the United States illegally and are able because humanitarian-based program immigrate if they can show that their children would suffer an extreme hardship, exceptional extreme hardship. There's only 4,000 visas annually that are given to people like that. We also have a law that says grandfathers, that's called uh, 245I, and that law allowed anybody who came here to the United States illegally, and if a family member who was a citizen or resident filed a petition to immigrate that person before April of 2001, that person can stay here and immigrate paying a fine. And then we have asylum cases in general where people come to this country. So there's six laws written into the Immigration Nationality Act that go against what part of the legal don't you understand. And all of these laws are a function of American foreign policy. And these laws are the same laws that have been written by Jade Hayward, Senator McCain, Senator Kyle, Congressman Blake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the height of the hypocrisy about all this. Yeah, and it, it, is, it is truly unfortunate. I know a lawyer uh, who worked for years and years on someone who wanted to stay here because she, if she went back to, back to Central America, she would be killed because she had ratted on some drug lords and stuff down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the recommendations kept coming back from the field office that she ought to get uh, asylum here. But then somebody would read it and say, oh, you think that's the right result? Re, 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 redo that. And so there's a lot of capriciousness in the system too, depending mm -hmm. upon who the people are that are reviewing it. And it's, it's an unfortunate system. Yes. Uh, real quickly, uh, I'll just play in all my cards here. I was involved in the governor's race over this past year and was writing policy. Uh, something that would out, also allow uh, me to help your presentation. In 2006, there was a UL study done at Arizona State, Arizona University, uh, U of A down there, that uh, showed it took all the data for economic figures and showed that Arizona actually has a net benefit of illegal aliens of $984 million annually. And that was a uh, study done back in 2006. Yeah, there are more recent studies than that that show that it's uh, the effect of SB 1070 is, is billions of dollars negative against us. Okay, I'm done. Thanks for Thank being you, here. Sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.